Well, let's start with the announcement from OPEC over the weekend. They rolled over the previous agreement, primarily due to the fact there's just so much uncertainty in this market around both China as well as a potential retaliation by Russia. So let's start with, with, with China, because um, without China, Russia's leverage in this market drops tremendously. And the best way to describe China is let's look at the price action of oil equities versus oil prices or copper versus oil. Copper and oil equities are forward anticipatory assets. They look out into the future. They've been pricing well over the last couple of weeks. Um, pricing on expectations of a reopening of China during 2Q of next year. In contrast, oil is dealing with the near-term problems of China, meaning that you know, your caseloads are increasing tremendously. When you look at high-risk districts, 75% of China's GDP is being impacted. Now, the concern is this creates a forced reopening. Oil demand drops. Oil prices on the front end collapse, but we know they're going to get out of it like most of these reopening scenarios. And by late 1Q, 2Q, demand is back up, which is why the equities are pricing well. So now well, let's that, bring this back. Mm -hmm. But uh, come, come back to us on, on, on that piece of it. So your expectation is over the next three months, the China element is going to be, it's going to be a rough ride. The question is how quickly you think that comes out on the other side. You said yeah, Q1. I mean, you think it's a Q2 situation? Q2 is our, is our base case, but the problem and why the market is very worried on the front end of the oil curve is what if we get a disorderly forced reopening where people self-impose lockdowns? They just don't want to go out and, and interact with anyone because the caseloads are rising so quickly. That's the risk that I think people in the oil market are fearful of, where you actually have a very sharp contraction in demand and then you're reopened and then you get the positive benefits um, later on. And I think that's the big fear factor in the oil market. And now unless if you bring Russia into the equation, his leverage is a function of that Chinese bid. If that Chinese bid's not there, his ability to retaliate um, drops tremendously. And then almost you're going to get an answer to both of these sometime in the next four to eight weeks. Because think about with Russia, they can announce retaliation. We can't verify it until all the ships that left right up. Because remember, part of the reason why oil prices came off is before that December 5th deadline, they loaded ship after ship after ship, send them out. We won't know if they retaliate until all those ships come back and they have to reload them. That's going to take, you know, two, four, six weeks before we actually know that. But also the situation with um, with China, we won't right. really know what happens until you probably get into you know, mid-January, February, about their ability to manage this. So hey, that uncertainty right. is creating the cap on oil. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. You, you, you talked about why, and it makes a lot of sense rationally, what you're talking about in terms of equity prices uh, for the fossil fuel companies. Having said that, folks have been piling into fossil fuels. Obviously, it was unloved for so very long. But at, at some point, uh, does, does the balance tip? I, I, I think it just looks strictly at relative returns. By the way, if you take the three-year moving average of the sharp ratio of the NASDAQ versus energy equities, the two are kissing right now. Um, we'll see how um, you know, people's aversion towards fossil fuels in that energy sector um, stands up when you actually have much better returns in the energy sector than you do NASDAQ and you know, the growthy tech names. Um, and as you start to move into that environment, I tend to think in talking to asset allocators, if they rank order the reasons they had an aversion towards this space, number one, history of bad returns. Let's not forget this sector destroyed 54 cents on every dollar it was given. Number two, high volatility, and then ESG was number three. And, and do you just buy with both hands? I mean, we have a list of uh, big oil on the screen, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, BP, Occidental. Any differentiation in your mind? Well, I mean, there, I, I'm not the equity analyst, and I right. can't have opinions on the, the, the different names. But I would argue that the space in general is very well positioned into 2023 under investment. The supply picture is bleak, to say the least. 
um, you know, particularly in non-OPEC ex-US, and shale's also disappointed. Um, the other point is inventories are incredibly low. We have no inventory, no spare capacity, and you're likely to see a sequential improvement in demand given what's going on in China in the rest of the world. So you put that together, 2023 is very positive for oil and energy. 